Hi everyone and welcome back to CM Equine. Today I'm going to be talking about the four quadrants of operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is one of the processes by which our animals and people learn. They learn by associating a behaviour with an outcome or a consequence of that behaviour and the consequences of behaviours can fall into one of four segments in a four quadrant grid. On the left hand side of the grid we have reinforcement and on the right hand side of the grid we have punishment. Along the top of the grid we have positive meaning we have positive reinforcement and positive punishment and on the bottom of the grid we have negative so negative reinforcement and negative punishment. These terms can be a little bit confusing for people. We often associate positive with things that are good and negative with things that are bad. However, within this context, it's really more like a math sum. Positive refers to the addition of something and negative refers to the taking away of something. We also all have a lot of associations with words like punishment and reinforcement already, but within this context, we can look at these terms and a more simplistic way. Reinforcement in this context is anything that increases the behaviour and punishment is anything that stops the behaviour. That is all you need to know to understand these terms. So let's dig down and look at each one of these quadrants on its own. Positive reinforcement. This is a term that people generally understand quite well. This is when the consequence of the behaviour is that the animal receives something that makes them want to continue to do that behaviour. For example, your horse might do something like stand still and you might reward that by giving them a food reward or giving them some scratches. This would work to reinforce what the animal was doing at the time that you gave the reward. You can stretch out the timing of when you give this reward so long as you use a marker such as a clicker in order to mark specific behaviour that you want to reward. Of course it goes without saying that you have to prime this clicker so that it means what you think Think it means the animal have the animal has to have already learned that the clicker means that a reward is coming and that they just need to continue to do the good behavior that they're doing where this can get messy is if your timing is off and you've not used the bridge your my animal might do something that you want to reinforce but by the time you give that treat or that scratch they have already changed what they're doing in this way you might accidentally reinforce moving around rather than standing still your animal can also anticipate getting the reward and get excited which might affect their behaviour. That's why behaviourists always recommend to use something like a bum bag to store your food so that food isn't in your pockets or on you all the time. This means your horse isn't trying to do all of its tricks in order to get treats at other times when it's not available. And we also encourage that you have a very tidy and systematic way of delivering your food rewards. You have to watch your body language and check that you're not reaching for your bum bag before the animal has done the thing that you want to reinforce. Otherwise this action of you reaching towards your bum bag might end up reinforcing the wrong behaviour. Where people also have concerns is around giving food rewards. They are worried that their horses might learn to bite. And it's true that if it's done poorly, then this can happen if you have bad habits yourself about how you deliver that food reward. However, if done correctly, it's a wonderful tool that's really humane and makes the training session really enjoyable for the horse. This can really help to change negative emotions such as fear, which are so often the cause of the behaviour problem in the first place. If your animal is super super excited about food it's perfectly fine to use scratches instead. I would recommend using firm scratches on the withers or somewhere that you know the animal likes. Where this goes wrong is people will give their horse a big slap and the horse doesn't actually get much out of that or enjoy it very much and so it's not a strong enough reinforcer. Sometimes they will start trying to mutually groom you back if your scratches are really good and this can maybe make things a little bit messy. But if you play around with the pressure and have it so that it's good enough to be reinforcing but not so good that your horse is all over you, then this can be a really good tool. Sometimes horses might not have much experience of using food rewards and taking food from your hands. They might be quite snatchy and they might catch you with their teeth by accident or they might become super preoccupied with the bum bag or wherever your food is on your body. This might then mean that you're trying to reward standing still but your horse keeps walking backwards as soon as the food reward is being given because they're trying to get there quickly. One way you can solve this issue is by not feeding directly from your hand. I have used upturned buckets or little silicone mats that I can put on the ground in front of the horse put and then I will deliver the food onto that surface for them to eat off of. This helps when I'm training standing still which is so often a foundation to everything I train. It means I can 
walk away, walk around the horse, move down to the back legs or wherever, and I can keep coming back and posting to the front. And my horse knows to stand still because that's where the food is going to be. It's going to be in front of them. It's not going to be on me. The type of food reward you use might vary depending on what you're trying to do. If you want them to be really calm, you might want to use something like chaff, something fairly low value that has a longer chew rate. This might allow you to capture that standing still or that nice calm behaviour that you're looking for. If you're doing something a bit more aversive or something under a bit of pressure like trying to get on a trailer or the vet is there now and you're trying to do an injection that needs to happen now, you can use something a little bit higher value such as carrots or apples. But in these scenarios that I'm talking about where something has to happen now, you're probably more likely to use counter conditioning, classical conditioning, or just use food as a lure. These are all valid in specific contexts, but it's important to realise that just because there's food involved doesn't mean that it's positive reinforcement. Food is involved in a lot of other aspects of learning and training. So food doesn't always mean positive reinforcement and positive reinforcement doesn't always mean food rewards or treats. It's important to assess at each stage what is working and what isn't and if you get stuck it's perfectly okay to have a consultation with a behaviourist. There's loads of online courses and podcasts that you can look at. Trudy Dempsey here in the southwest does a lot of courses online, mentorships, uh, in-person courses and she also has a podcast all about positive reinforcement. I'll leave some links to that in the description in case anyone is interested. Next, let's look at negative reinforcement. A lot of people get confused about this, like I say. Sometimes when I've mentioned negative reinforcement, people have thought that I was talking about punishment. That isn't the case, but negative reinforcement done incorrectly or done a bit too much can stray into the punishment area. So you have to be quite skilled at this in order to do it in an ethical way. Horse riders use negative reinforcement all of the time. Most of what we do with horses is negative reinforcement. When we're leading them or riding them, applying pressure to the reins to get your horse to stop is negative reinforcement. Applying pressure with your heels to get them to move forwards is negative reinforcement. Applying pressure on a lead drop to get them to move forwards or stop is negative reinforcement. The key with negative reinforcement isn't when the pressure is applied necessarily, it's when the pressure is released. The pressure that you are applying through a lead drop or your heels or the reins is a negative stimulus. It's designed to be uncomfortable for the horse. It should never be excessive or painful. People use this pressure as cues and instructions to tell their horse what they want them to do. And then they remove the cues and release the pressure when the horse does what is asked. It's actually quite an intuitive method of training, which is why a lot of people do it rather than re positive reinforcement, because that cue is built in from the very beginning. Another context of using negative reinforcement is when you're approaching or retreating from a nervous animal that doesn't want to be caught. You might approach and stand a metre away and they might tense and be nervous and be on the brink of running away. If you keep going, they'll just go, they'll just run away. But if you stop there, they're standing still, which is what you want. You can reward that or reinforce that by taking a step back. So the pressure of you being there is being released by you removing yourself. You can then shape this by then approaching to about half a metre and then retreating, then approaching and standing next to them and then retreating. Then you might approach, give them a little touch on the withers, then retreat. And in this way, using negative reinforcement as in approach and retreat, you can stretch that comfort zone and eventually you can get to a place where they are comfortable having you next to them. You can give them scratches and you can even give them food rewards. This is much easier than trying to get up to them and give them scratches or food rewards in the beginning. If you try to give them food when they're still really nervous of you, they will just reach out and be uncomfortable but wanting to get the food. As soon as they get the food, they'll grab it and kind of run away. So that's not very good training. They're not learning to be approached or to stand still and calm. They're basically just being bribed to do something that they don't want to do for something quite high reward that they really want. A lot of us would do something that we didn't really want to do if we got a reward of say a thousand pounds or a million pounds. Using food in this way can be a bit like that. And so it's actually much more humane to use this approach and retreat negative reinforcement training technique until you can get up to them and have them be relaxed. In an ideal world, we would want the horse to have consent and do everything on their own terms and choose to be with us. However, that's not the world we live in. 
sometimes in domestication you have to get up to your horse in order to give it important veterinary treatments. There's a lot of things like injections, dentists, barriers that are very unnatural for your horse and that they don't want to do. They will never want to do and they'll never enjoy it, but they can learn to tolerate it and be calm. Using a mixture of positive and negative reinforcement can really help to prepare them for real life. If this animal is going to be rehomed and it might be handled by a lot of different people with different styles, then it's important to generalise them and fully prepare them to cope with the normal negative reinforcement that they will experience in another home. If it's only your own horse and there's no staff or yard managers or vets or anyone that needs to handle them when you're not there, then you're perfectly entitled to do what you want and just fully work in cooperative care and positive reinforcement. That's obviously really nice and great for you and your horse. But if you have other people who are going to go and use negative reinforcement to catch your horse and lead it around and do all of this normal stuff, then you have to prepare them for that. It's the most fair thing that you can do. So next, let's chat about negative punishment. This stops the behaviour by removing something that the horse wants. Like with positive reinforcement, this has to be timed to be exactly when the horse is performing the behaviour that you don't want. You can't say, that was a bad training session today, so I'm not going to give him food or water later. That's obviously highly unethical, very cruel, bad for welfare, etc. I have heard of that being done in instances where they're trying to break in colts. They want to have them be a bit tired, a bit sluggish, so that it makes their job easier. This technically isn't negative punishment, it's just cruel. The main context that I think about negative punishment is when a horse is maybe coming up and invading your space and being a bit muggy, looking for treats, biting your clothing, trying to play with you. This is quite an issue with younger horses and foals. I work with donkeys a lot and this is quite an issue with donkeys. They are quite friendly. Um, they will come up and they like to play with items and head collars and clothes and they'll bite and pull you around. <laughs> They'll come up and they'll give you a hug, they'll put their head on your shoulder. As um, cute and lovely as this can be, this can also stray into being quite dangerous. For example, it doesn't take much for a donkey to miss and bite you by accident, or they might get really friendly and that head on the shoulder might turn into them mounting you, which does happen, and as funny as that sounds, because they do that to each other quite a lot. So they might do that to you too. They can also get really frustrated if they're up doing this and looking for attention and food and they don't get it. They can have a frustrated outburst and escalate that behaviour to try and get what they want. Where negative punishment would come into this is to ignore this behaviour and remove what they want which is you and your food and your pockets and your attention. But like I said when you remove this they get really frustrated and they will escalate this behaviour and it might get dangerous. So while there is a place for negative punishment, you certainly don't want to encourage this behaviour. You do have to ignore it and try to safely remove yourself when they do this. However, I'd always recommend pairing this with positive reinforcement. So when the animal is standing calmly, you do give it the attention and you do give it a big reward. They will get very frustrated if all you're seeing is no, 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 telling them off pushing them away for one that will probably reinforce it because they want to be playing and they want to be touched that's what they're asking for and you're reinforcing it by pushing them away and it doesn't feel very good for them to be told no all the time when they have a need that they're trying to express with their behavior they know what they want and they're trying to get it and they just don't know how to get it they don't know what you want so you can ignore this behavior make sure it's ineffective but you should also reward the behavior that you do want that calm relaxed coming up standing next to you and asking nicely for a scratch this way they'll go ah so that doesn't work but this does work so i'll do that if nothing works they'll just get bigger and bigger and more dangerous in their behavior and Again, it can be dangerous to ignore this behaviour. You might actually be waiting a long time or might never see the behaviour that you want in order to reward it. So if you have a donkey or a horse with these kind of issues and it's getting a bit out of hand, it can be really helpful to work in protective contact. So there's a fence or gate in between you that you can reach over and reward, but they can't jump on you or knock you over if they get frustrated and it goes wrong. You can also ensure that the circumstances in which this behaviour happens are not practiced so 
if during your training sessions it's going really well but you are going into like poop pick or muck out or in the pasture with them and they're showing the behaviour there you're not in training mode so you're not maybe paying full attention and you're accidentally rewarding or punishing the wrong behaviours and so I would always recommend just shutting them in a separate area, putting them inside so that you can poop pick and not have to worry about getting hurt or reinforcing or punishing the wrong things. It's important to remain safe and remember that this quite cute and funny behaviour can quickly become not so cute and funny. And finally, let's talk about positive punishment. This is a really confusing term for people because positive and punishment seem to be opposites. But again, positive is adding something that will stop the behaviour to punish it. So here we're talking about hitting, shouting, smacking, whipping, all of those horrible things. Positive punishment can be effective to stop behaviours. There might be certain dangerous behaviours such as kicking or rearing that you want to stop and nip in the bud and people will use punishment to put a stop to it. They feel they have to because it's the safest option and it can be. However, it's important to remember that our punishment might be retaliated. If pain or fear is the issue, adding in more pain and more fear might just make the problem worse. It might cause your horse or donkey to get aggressive back at you. So you do take a risk every time you use positive punishment. You also risk damaging the relationship because if you have formed a nice trusting relationship, and then you punish your horse by hitting them, that ruins the trust a bit. Why should they trust you from here on out? It would be far better to recognise the signs that your horse might be about to exhibit a big dangerous behaviour like a rear or a buck. They hardly ever just do this without any warning signs. And rather than pushing through, stopping, reassessing and trying to de-escalate the situation before it gets to that point, it's often the case that it's caused by a pain or medical condition such as kissing spine or like lameness. And so you don't have to punish to stop the behaviour, you just have to fix the underlying condition. And people will justify punishment because they'll say, horses do much worse to each other in the wild, they kick, they bite, they pin each other to the ground. And that's true, horses are very strong animals. They can kill each other and do serious harm, but you are not using punishment to that level, and nor should you. The punishment you're using probably isn't bad enough to even be effective, so it's kind of pointless. It's a pointless risk to take that doesn't yield many good results. You also have to take that individual into account. Some horses are so desensitised to being shouted at and live in very busy environments where there is a lot of shouting and instructors shouting. So shouting at them doesn't really punish anything. They just learn to tune it out. Other horses that are from a more quiet environment that are a bit more neurotic and nervous they might have had trauma, they might be terrified by you shouting or pointing at them in a bit of an aggressive gesture. You risk adding a lot of fear to this situation and fear just makes everything worse. All this goes to say that I really don't think positive punishment is worth it most of the time. There is a place for it, it is that last line on the Lima guidelines, the least intrusive, minimally aversive. Once you've exhausted all other options, it can be justifiable to use it. It can be justifiable to use it in an emergency. If something has become very dangerous and the only way that you can think of to put a stop to this and de-escalate and potentially save life is to use positive punishment, then that is justified. But once it reaches that point, it really has gotten out of control and it's important to recognise that. I don't think we should be using positive punishment on day-to-day -day basis. It's become so common for people to ride with whips, for example, and they would defend it and say it's for safety. But a lot of the issues that then require whipping are completely preventable or they're training issues. A lot of people just use it to back up their leg, but what they're doing is causing pain and spooking the horse forward a bit. They're not teaching the horse to stop doing anything, they're just trying to chase it forwards. I guess they're technically punishing not listening to the leg, but it's very murky and a bit abstract and the horse is probably not going to understand that. They'll probably just get into that habit of the leg goes on, I ignore it, then I guess Mac and it go forwards. They're not learning to respond to the leg though because probably you are putting leg on, putting leg on, putting leg on. Even after they move, your leg might still be on because you're trying to drive them forwards. What you need to do in this scenario is 
maybe just go back to a walk, practice applying constant pressure with the leg and releasing it with good timing when they move forwards and do what you want to do. We shouldn't have to rely on using a whip because our leg aids are ineffective and because our horses are confused and don't understand how to follow our leg instructions. A lot of inexperienced riders and children will ride with whips because they ride riding school ponies that have a lot of varied riders and varied skill level. They can become quite dead to the leg. And so it's become common in our community for kids and teenagers to just be given a nice pink glittery whip in the shape of a star at the end and told to give it three hard smacks if the horse just ignores them. We would never give a kid a whip to hit any other animal but somehow this is acceptable. In fact I don't think I've ever seen a situation where a kid has been saved from a dangerous situation because they had a whip. More often if a horse tanks off or does something dangerous they cry, they fall off, they panic, they forget the whip exists. The only time I see kids using whips is when horses ignore them or to give them a smack on the shoulder when they're going around the course of jumps. So I just don't think it's a valid argument. And I do get, I have ridden horses that have completely ignored me and it is very frustrating. But being frustrated isn't a good excuse for using a whip, in my opinion. It's not your horse and you don't have that relationship. It's not your fault and it's not the horse's fault that there's a bit of a miscommunication and they're not moving as they should when you ask. It's just one of those things. And you know, people will say, well, it's nicer to give them one whip than just to boot them, boot them repeatedly with your legs. That's probably true. It's just a shame that people and horses are put in these situations where they are mismatched, the horse hasn't been trained to respond to leg, and they're left completely confused and with probably bruised sides from all of the kicking. And the people are left not having fun, feeling embarrassed, feeling demotivated, and feeling bad, honestly, for the horse and for themselves. Or they completely just think, the horse is taking the piss, it doesn't like me, it doesn't respect me. None of that is true, that's not in the horse's nature. The horse genuinely doesn't know any better or there's something that you're doing that's a bit confusing, it's different to what they're used to and so they, they are not keen to move forwards, they don't understand. So what I'm saying, long story short, is I do understand why whips are used and I understand why people use positive punishment and why it can be justified sometimes, but I just don't think it's used correctly well or in a valid ways most of the time and I think it's something that we all need to have a think about and reflect on about our own riding and our own practices. Mistakes happen and it's hard to break habits if you're used to carrying a whip and using it. I know when I stopped riding with a whip I could feel moments where I did go to instinctively use it and it wasn't there. That actually was a really interesting exercise for me because I didn't realise that I had been using it as much as I was. And you know, I at the time it was just a schooling whip and I would give them a little flick, that's what I was used to. But a little flick is still painful. Um, and yeah, I'm not proud that I used it much more than I thought I did back in the day. And so now when I do ride, which isn't often because Willow's 25, but I never ride with a whip. And if she doesn't want to move forwards, I kind of take it as fair enough, you're 25, you've got arthritis. It's probably a good reason why you don't want to move forwards. I'm not going to push it. So yeah, I'm not judging. Maybe I am a little bit, but it's okay. As long as we're all improving and trying to change for the better together, that is great news for me and for horses everywhere. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope that it cleared some things up about operant conditioning, reinforcement, punishment, positive, negative, etc. If you have any questions, pop them down in the comment section. I think it's so important for everyone that works with animals in any capacity to understand all of these terms and how learning works. And there's so much learning you could do about this. I think I've been learning about it for years and I'm constantly learning more and refining my training techniques and getting better. So yeah, even us certified and qualified behaviourists are still working on our own skills all of the time. So it's perfectly okay not to be perfect, just to try to be better. Subscribe to my channel if you're interested in learning more about equine behaviour or behaviour in general. I'm sorry that it's been so long since I last uploaded, life has been very crazy. But hopefully I'll be back to some more regular uploads and I will see you in the next one. Thanks for watching, bye.
Thank you.